Good afternoon or uh, good morning. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about the collections at, in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress. There are nearly 18,000 pictorial works related to Native people and Native life at the library. About 75% of those are photographs. Most of the images were made between 1860 and 1940. Most of them depict Native people and communities west of the Mississippi. All but a few were created by non-Indians. During this presentation, I'll first give a brief, broad, and very fast overview of the collection. And then next, I'll talk about a few categories that I think are either particularly interesting or that are less researched topics. And finally, I'll talk about the improvements that are being made at the library in cataloging, collection development, and access. And the handouts outline these categories. You don't really have to follow every image on the handouts. I wanted to make the handout because I won't have time to describe every image, telling you who photographed it, what it is, when it was taken. So that's why I thought the handout was uh, essential. Most of the photographs at the library were, were acquired through copyright deposit. It seems that no other group appealed to commercial photographers more than Native people. Portrayed in, quote, exotic, noble, and savage poses, indigenous cultures fascinated non-Natives. Among the earliest portraits of Native Americans were those made of delegates who traveled to the capital for diplomatic purposes. Later, government survey and independent photographers recorded life in native communities on or near reservations where many tribes were forced to relocate. Images of traditional and ceremonial life were just as appealing as those which documented how communal life was changing. <coughs> Many photographs show how survival increasingly depended on programs established by the federal government. To escape the, har the harsh conditions of reservation life, some Native people became performers in the much photographed Wild West shows, including Buffalo Bill Cody's, which traveled nationwide into Europe. Large numbers of photographs also document the, quote, transformation of students at Indian schools, showing that boys and girls could and should adopt the manners of the dominant white culture. In contrast to the documentary style reviewed so far, pictorialist photographers offered a different image of Native Americans. The pictorialist movement was based on the concept that photography was fine art similar to drawing and painting. Through soft focus, cropping, and other means of technical manipulation, pictorialist photographers made aesthetically pleasing, idealized, and highly romantic portraits of Indians in Indian life. A smaller number of pictorial records in the library 
document contemporary life of Native people. These important images offer views of family life, daily life and work, These are Mohawk steel workers. Recreation and play. Racism toward Native people. Dynamic Native Leaders. This is LaDonna Harris. That's Ben Nighthorse Campbell at Clinton's inaugural parade. Government Relations and Activism. This is Native protesters camped at the Capitol at the end of the five month <coughs> cross country longest walk. And protesters occupying the BIA building. And finally, in many cases, the photographs document the joy in Native communities. I hope this overview has provided some sense of the scope and limitations of our holdings. And now I'd like to discuss the work of the only Native photographer represented at the library, Richard Throssell. Richard Throssell, a Cree Indian adopted by the Crow, was one of the most prolific early indigenous photographers. Born in the Pacific Northwest, Russell moved to the Crow Reservation in Montana, where he documented the people, their traditions, their leaders, the process of acculturation during the, the early 1900s. He also photographed to a much, lesser, le a much lesser extent the Northern Cheyenne community. This is an owl dam. Altogether, he created nearly 1,000 images and the library has a small collection of his work, which came through the Copyright Office. <laughs> this is Long Otter, a Crow war leader. Thrussell also briefly worked as a photographer for the federal government, producing health education images for a campaign against the spread of tuberculosis on reservations. In 1916, he, beca he began to speak out as a native, native rights activist and was later elected to the Montana State Legislature. During his photographic career, Thrussell photographed for both non-Indian and Indian audiences. In some of his commercial work, he promoted himself as a real Indian who photographed authentic Indian life. And he often used hand-drawn symbols patterned after Native American pictographs on his work. In this example, he uses his trademark signature. Thrussell was very much influenced by the work of pictorialist photographers such as Joseph Dixon and Edward Curtis, both of whom he met. According to Thrussell, his photographic career reached a turning point after he viewed Curtis's nostalgic, romantic, artistic images. This is called Cheyenne Warrior of the Future. Here Live the Crow by Throssel is remarkably similar to Curtis's At the Water's Edge. One wonders, however, if Throssel also influenced Curtis since Throssel's image was copyrighted in 1907 and Curtis's was copyrighted three years later. We do know that Curtis falsely claimed credit for one of Thrussell's photographs. 
I know I mentioned this yesterday, but I'm going to go through it again in case some of you uh, weren't there yesterday. Because he was a tribal member, Thrassel was allowed to photograph where non-natives were typically prohibited. In 1909, he documented a rarely performed Northern Cheyenne ceremonial dance and gave Curtis a photograph in the series. Curtis promptly copyrighted the image in his own name and then included it in his 20-volume North American Indian publication. In her book about Thrassel, Peggy Albright explains, quote, it would be difficult to overstate the significance of this photographic image, a recording of one of the Cheyenne's rarest and most sacred ceremonies, which was then banned by government regulation. This image and 12 others taken by Thrassel that year comprise the first visual records of the dance and the only known images of the 1909 offering. Thrassel's description also represents the first eyewitness account in the literature. End of quote. Although Curt Curtis did not did credit Thrassel for the description, he did not for the published photograph. I'd now like to turn to other categories of representations of indigenous people. One type is what Philip Deloria refers to as Indians in unexpected places, that is, ways in which native people turn up in places and occupations where mainstream culture doesn't expect them. Mrs. Many Horses, a typist for the Indian agent at Glacier National Park, seems inappropriate in her role while she plays with her gum. <laughs> <coughs> Sioux Chief Big Turnup and his family are being entertained by George Creel, the U.S. Commissioner to the San Francisco Golden Gate International Exposition. And here are three Native Americans uh, looking over Chicago's skyline from the roof of a hotel in 1929. This type of photograph, which exaggerates cultural differences as a means of humor, was a popular stage device for picture postcards, especially during the first part of the 1900s. <coughs> Copyrighted in 1904, this image is titled New Home and was taken near Seattle. This similar image taken by another photographer, but also focusing on the modern sewing machine, shows the inside of a temporary shelter. The caption for this image, which reads, their teepee now has TV, demonstrates that Native people were still playfully, I'm not sure playfully is the right word, um, depicted as less advanced or backward in 1956. The category of Indian hobbyists, or non-Indians pretending to be Indians, is also well represented in the library's collection. This is a family of white people playing Indian at a New York fair in 1908. And children wearing Indian masks in te Texas. This is a salesman in a traveling medicine show in Tennessee in 1935. A number of Native scholars have written about white America's desire to play Indian, include, including Gerald Visner in his short essay on trickster photography. In the essay, he describes the fictitious celebrated photographer Toon Brown, who was born on the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota which incidentally is where uh, Visner was born. Brown photographs white people who pretend to be tribal. He is called the Edward Curtis of the White Pretender and is, quote, capturing the vanishing white man at his own game. <laughs> so 
The next category is reaction to photography images, or what James Ferris calls avoidance or resistance photographs. Historically, photographs were taken by outsiders who insinuated themselves into an intimate tribal environment. For example, in this 1897 photograph, the Hopi priests are nearly crowded out by the photographers and tourists. Throughout the years, photographers relentlessly ignored the personal boundaries of Native people, and many images document how the subjects tried to avoid the camera. This image shows Native women selling their baskets in Sitka, Alaska around 1890. <coughs> This image, taken in 1922 by a U.S. government surveyor in Arizona, reflects the same lack of concern by the photographer. A caption from the series reads, quote, it cost a half a dollar to induce one squaw to show her face. This sign was placed outside Old Oribe in 1974 by Mina Lanza, who was then acting as village chief. It was put up at the request of villagers because of their experiences with disrespectful tourists and photographers. <laughs> now I'd like to switch gears and talk about stereotypical and racist images and words and how the native voice today is influencing descriptions. By providing more accurate information, including identification of individuals and cultural practices, Indians are rewriting descriptions which better reflect their heritage. I think this is an extremely important development because historically, descriptions have played a big part in creating stereotypes and negative depictions of Native Americans. Generic captions such as squaw, chief, brave, and maiden contributed to the objectification of Native people and kept their real identities a mystery. For example, the caption for this photograph reads, Comanche, buck, and squaw. Which is the man and which is the woman? New information revealed that the two were not Comanches, but Kiowas. He was an important military leader named Trailing the Enemy, and she was probably the daughter of the prominent chief, Satanta. Similarly, the before and after photographs taken of, quote, educated Indian children, stereotyped Indians as primitive and whites as civilized. Here are two examples of this type of bias from a unique 1870 Western photographic album. The caption reads, uncivilized girls and happy hunting grounds. The caption for this image, taken at the same time by the same photographer, explains that these Tonto Apache girls, who have adopted hairstyles, clothing, and religion of the white cultures, are, quote, civilized Christians, good girls. Offensive and degrading captions have also portrayed Indian people as inferior, bloodthirsty, supernatural, drunk, lazy, and mystical. Too frequently, the messages in historic images have mocked and disparaged tribal cultures. Rick Hill, a Tuscarora photographer and educator who has written about stereotyping, describes the far-reaching effects this way. The camera photographed Indians, but the viewers saw losers. Today, thanks to the efforts of tribal historians and activists, the trend is moving away from objectification toward humanization. At the Library of Congress, for example, catalogers who describe native images now rewrite and update records as new information becomes available. This image is one example. This type of photograph, similar to others I showed earlier, was a popular genre used to depict nameless native people. 
According to information given to the library from the Coeur Lane <coughs> tribe, however, the car was in fact, uh, in fact owned by Philip Wildshoe, who was seated behind the wheel. The other people in the car are his relatives, who are also now identified. Philip was a successful farmer and rancher and the son of the chief of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. He was also a great baseball fan and drove the car thousands of miles to semi-pro game, semi games throughout the inland northwest. Many tribal elders still reminisce about riding in this car to games and other events. This is just one example of how information can transform an image from a stereotype into a valuable family and cultural work. Wilson Parker posed for this Edward Curtis photograph wearing a wig and a bearskin cape over his blue jeans. The published title is simply Whaler, Macaw, and no name is given. Parker's relatives, some of whom now work at the Macaw Cultural and Research Center in Nia Bay, have identified him and display this image prominently in their whaling exhibit. Again, the macaws have found value in an image viewed by some as a generic representation and transformed it into self-representation. The next two images, also taken by Edward Curtis, have become important family documents. This one is titled Women's Primitive Dress, Talawa. The girl was recently identified as Ada Lopez Richards by her granddaughter who came to the Prince and Photographs Division. The Curtis photograph was taken when she was 15, and this one was taken when she was 94. Her 13-year-old sister Dorothy was also photographed during Curtis's visit to Northwestern California in the 1920s. And this photograph was taken of her when she was 92. And finally, here is one more recent example among many of identifying the nameless. This is from the library's collection of political posters from the 1970s to which we've added the name Bobby Onko, a Kiowa and member of the American Indian Movement. The photograph was taken at Pine Ridge in 1973 and the poster was made later. In this section I hope I have emphasized that despite decades of misrepresentation, the new information that slowly comes to the library about these images contributes to a more accurate account of Native American history and greatly enriches the value of these works. I'd now like to turn briefly to recent collection development efforts at the library, which reflect a greater interest in work by and of Native people. The library's most recent acquisition in this area is the only known daguerreotype of the Cherokee leader, John Ross. This unique image was made about 1850 and was purchased by the library for $70,000. Another example which recently came to the library as part of a purchase collection is this image of Red Cloud, which was taken around 1881 by a Nebraska commercial photographer. It was recently published in Frank Goodyear's book, Red Cloud, Photographs of a Lakota Chief. The photograph is important because according to Goodyear, Red Cloud's descendants had never seen this image before. They were particularly curious about the hairstyle, which is not characteristic of the manner in which Lakota men wear their hair. Turning to contemporary work, in 1999 the library acquired through a gift some work by Gary Auerbach, a Tucson photographer who has joined us today. We're grateful that you're here, Gary. Although Auerbach is not a native photographer, I think that the, that the dynamic he has established between he and his subjects exemplifies a more balanced approach that gives voice to the Native American perspective. This is Martha and Douglas Miles, uh, Navajo and San Carlos Apache. Working with Ophelia Zabita, a distinguished professor of linguistics from the Tohono O'odham Nation, Auerbach devised a series of interview questions which invite the photographic subject into the process. This way the subjects can tell Gary and the viewer as much as they want about themselves. The personal in interviews accompany the photographs. This is Ruth Benally, 
Navajo. And this is Jerry Haron and his dog from Tao's Pueblo. Can you see the little dog? And finally, I want to mention that our curators are currently negotiating with a group of five native photographers in hopes of adding their collections, hopes of adding their work to our collection. Can I have the next carousel? Finally, my last topic. I want to discuss access. I hope that now that you've seen some of the images, you want to know how to get access to more. All the Indian-related images in the Prints and Photographs Division are easily accessible to researchers visiting the library. About a quarter of the collection is online, and on the back of the handout, it gives you the uh, website. Many of the collections are described in this 150-page reference guide, which is free to researchers. Almost all the images are also in the public domain, which means that anyone can use public domain images in any way they want, including the culturally sensitive photographs. Here are some recent examples of how two of our historic public domain images have been used creatively in posters. This is Sitting Bull taken in uh, 1881. And it was used in this 1970s poster. This is Geronimo, uh, 1886, with his son and a couple other warriors from the famous C.S. Fly series. And this is my favorite. <laughs> so we have, we have some copies of images that are in other collections, so while other institutions, rather. So while one institution may prohibit the use, even the viewing, since most of ours are public domain, we, we cannot control that. For example, many institutions have, copied, have copies of, this, of the historic image Monty Russell used in his own photograph, which appeared on the cover of Aperture in 1995. Although the historic image was taken during Navajo's captivity at Bosque Redondo, the photograph in our collection was copyrighted in 1914 by a man in New York State. In conclusion, I hope I have succeeded in suggesting that there are many ways of viewing photographs. Although sometimes an image reveals more about the photographer or more about attitudes than it does about the photographic subject, I think there is still so much to learn about the library's collections and that the images can be valuable to Native nations. I'm reminded of the powerful words of Hulea Sinaidini who's Seminole Muscogee and Diné. She's an art critic and a, uh, one of my very favorite photographers, uh, one of my role models. She says, it was a beautiful day when I decided that I would take responsibility to reinterpret images of native peoples. Even though flawed, these 19th century images were very significant in filling the empty pages of my family album. Although Mooney and Curtis and others thought they were imaging a vanishing race. I see the contrary. I see perseverance. Thank you.